All right. So just a reminder, um, for those of y'all that haven't turned in your River Lab yet, um, please get it to me today. And uh, I will start to get the Rock Lab traded and the River Lab in as well very soon. Um, you have chapter three and four homeworks that are up. Um, they will be due at the end of the week when we take the chapter three and four tests. So that's going to come Friday. Um, we're going to continue with our, our uh, plate tectonics lecture today. And hopefully my video works because that's a little frustrating. Um, anything else? No, I think that's it. Make sure you get your River Lab in. Make sure you're working on your chapter three and four homeworks because that we do at the end of the week. We're going to take the three and four tests. Um, which will be similar in format and length uh, to the other ones. I might cut it down a little bit and try to do a 45 minute test because uh, some people were having problems with the hour long format seeing as we have a 45 minute class. Um, this one's not too bad because y'all could spill over into activity period if you want, but uh, first period can't do that and uh, 45 minutes might just be better. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'll probably find a couple questions that I'm like, ah, these don't need to be in here. Uh, so let me get a sip of water before I keep going. I would like a piece of morning gum. Here we go, plate tectonics. Um, so Friday, we already went over some of this. We basically outlined um, the, the evidence behind the continental drift and what kind of supports the continental drift. Um, and it was several things, starting off with the fit of the continents, um, South, South America and Africa are obviously the two that work together really well. Um, actually, North America does kind of fit into this because once these two come together, um, the, the northern coast here of uh, South America actually fits really well with the Gulf Coast. And then Florida kind of sticks right in between this little uh, crack here in between Africa and South America. And so you can see that kind of happening down here on this map. Um, you might be able to see it better on your Chromebooks, but um, they all kind of fit together pretty well. Um, so the fit of the continents was, was uh, kind of the starting off point. And then we just found more and more evidence uh, fossils from animals that didn't really have um, a, a super great explanation for how they would travel from the continent to continent um, in, in modern day formation. And even if they could, which we talked about drifting and rafting and uh, land bridges and all that stuff, um, even if they could do that, some of these continents have very different climates. Um, so like this guy living in Africa and India, okay, fine. But he also lived in Antarctica. Um, that's not the same climate. Um, usually animals don't live in, in um, such varied climates like that. And so uh, different fossils in different continents that didn't really have a great explanation for how they got there and why they would be in those different climates uh, was the next step. Then we started to see mountain ranges, which um, not only had very similar, similar features um, and rock types and structure, um, on different sides of the oceans, but also didn't really have an explanation for how they got formed on the coast like this. Um, like the Atlas Mountains here, what smashed those mountains up into the formation that they have today? Because there's nothing really there right now. Um, and so that, that needed some explanation. And when you start to move the continents together, you see that, oh, now it makes sense that they all have similar dates, similar rock types, and, and what formed them, the continents actually coming together in the first place. And when they hit, the mountain ranges kind of got smashed up. Uh, and so that was another piece of the puzzle. And then uh, we went into glaciation and talked about how um, lots of different continents have glacial evidence like striations, glacial till, moraines, um, that would suggest that they had large glaciers at some point in time. But their current climate and their current location on the Earth uh, doesn't make sense for that. Uh, the southern half of Africa, while maybe the tip gets some cold weather every once in a while, um, glaciers all over the southern half of Africa and even Madagascar um, don't make a lot of sense. They don't fit in with how we know Africa today. 
including India, um, the southern part of Australia. And so when you start to put all the continents together um, and you actually get into magnetic uh, understanding of the rocks and how the poles move around, um, you see that all the continents were lower down towards the South Pole and one large glaciation could kind of explain all of this. Um, and so all of these were features that kind of fit together to support uh, Wegener's continental drift hypothesis, which, by the way, um, just didn't really pan out because of two reasons. Um, it didn't have a explanation for how the continents moved around. Um, it was just this kind of vague term drift. They just drift about like uh, like boats, lost boats on the ocean, um, which is not really true. There, there is a, a, a scientific explanation for how something as large as a continent actually moves from one side of the planet to the other. Um, and then there was no why, um, how they move around and why they move around, what forces them to move in the directions they do, why would they come together and then break back apart, um, what's causing this stuff. And so as we learned more um, and got some more information and, and more uh, justification for this, um, it wasn't enough just to change the continental drift hypothesis. Um, it was very similar to what we have, but it, the differences were enough where we had to completely remake it, and we ended up coming up with the theory of plate tectonics. Um, I don't know what slides I remember teaching on. This is now like my, uh, at least my third year, maybe my fourth year teaching this class, um, specifically this class at Palmer. Um, and I swear we talk about Harry Hess, and there's no Harry Hess in these slides. Um, and so maybe I'm thinking of a different set of slides that I used to use, um, or maybe every year I say it and it's just not in the slides. But when they talk about oceanic, uh, oceanographic exploration, um, which increased dramatically following World War II, um, the, the kind of starting off point for that would be Harry Hess. And actually, he was doing his during World War II. Um, and so um, as we're traveling in our uh, military ships from the United States to Europe and Asia um, and from the United States over to Japan and the islands in the Pacific Ocean, um, we are always, not everyone on the boat, but we're doing science, at least minimal science as we go along there. Um, one of the things that all boats are concerned in, how close they are to the bottom of the ocean. Um, even out in the middle of the ocean, you want to know that because uh, you don't want to run your boat ashore just thinking, yeah, nothing's going to happen. Um, and then all of a sudden you hit a piece of land and you, you're you sinking um, and there's nothing you can do about it. So um, boats historically, whether military or private, private, have always been concerned with taking depth measurements and knowing uh, what the depth is uh, and trying to build better maps where you can. Um, and so World War II... We actually have a decent amount of technology. They're not just throwing anchors over the side and measuring how far down they go. Um, we have submarines. We have underground, uh, not underground, underwater sonar and radar. And um, we're, we're using these not only to look for um, enemies or friendly boats, but we're using these to kind of figure out how deep the ocean is and what's going on. And so Harry Hess, who I believe was in the Navy, um, it would make sense that he was in the Navy, but honestly, he could have been in the Army or in uh, the Air Force. Those giant boats have all the different uh, branches on them. He's um, taking several trips from the United States over to Europe, and they're taking depth measurements the entire way. And something Harry Hess and probably many of his colleagues noticed um, was as they took these depth measurements, every single time, no matter how far south or no matter how far north they went, just about the midway point between the United States and between Europe, um, they saw an underwater mountain range. Um, so when you leave the shore, you get a little bit of, of drop off and then the, the elevation goes down quite a bit and you get your deep ocean basin where just you know things sink and you're not ever bringing them back to the surface. They're way too far deep. But then in the middle, the elevation would start to climb. And, and then it would climb for a little bit, it would level off, and then it would come back down. Um, and every trip they made back and forth, even if they went to different locations or different latitudes, north and south, every single trip would have this mountain range hidden beneath the surface. Um, and so they figured out quickly that it wasn't just one hill or one mountain. It was a long strip 
of mountains, this, this long ridge, if you will. Um, and so the idea of this oceanic ridge system um, came about um, really in World War II, not really following World War II, but um, in World War II, we started to notice this. Notice this. Um, another thing we started to notice was that in the Pacific Ocean, um, kind of over towards Japan, um, the earthquakes that happened were stronger and they happened much deeper inside the ground. Um, they, they weren't shallow earthquakes um, that we're used to seeing on the continents. Um, they, they were very deep um, and they built up a lot of energy. And so they trace those to these trenches, these very, very deep trenches um, out in the Pacific Ocean. Because again, they can take depth measurements pretty accurately there. Um, another thing that they noticed was that while we had dated um, rocks on the continent to be very, very old, um, many hundreds of millions of years, if not uh, a billion years or several billion years, um, there were not any old oceanic rocks. Um, whatever samples you took from the ocean floor, um, they were never older than 180 million years old, which is relatively very, very young. Um, so all of these are uh, kind of like with the continental drift hypothesis, we're getting kind of pieces of this puzzle that we're going to need to build some sort of uh, some sort of explanation for how this is going to work together. So the last one here is there's just not a lot of sediment in the ocean basins, which you think that there would be. There's a lot of stuff living and dying. Um, all the oceans are kind of bringing their sand and sediment out into the ocean uh, from the continents. Not all the oceans, all the rivers and streams. Um, but when you look at sediments on the land, like if you go to the Grand Canyon, um, the Grand Canyon is hundreds and hundreds of feet of sedimentary rock that's been built up. In the oceans, you don't really ever get anything that thick. Um, you know, they're, they're only really thin sediment accumulations in the very deep ocean basins, um, which didn't make a lot of sense to them. Why? Why is it like that? And so all of this put together started to form um, the theory of plate tectonics. And what we figured out as we went around and did more science um, was that we have two different types of crustal rock. Um, instead of calling it crust, we're going to give it a scientific name, lithosphere, which lith litho or litho means rock, um, and sphere is going to be like your 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 spherical globe kind of uh, thing, like hydrosphere, biosphere, atmosphere. Um, so the lithosphere is the crust and the uppermost coolest mantle. Um, it's the stuff that's on the outside that we can see, we can access. Um, and there's two different types. You have oceanic lithosphere, which is not very thick. It says varies in thickness, um, but the thickest one is 100 kilometers thick, which is which is actually pretty thin. Um, most of them are thinner than that. Um, they have may mafic composition, so usually they're dark colored. They're high in metals, uh, magnesium and and uh, I almost said ferric and iron. Um, and because they're higher in metals, they're going to be more dense than your continental lithosphere. And we'll talk about the density later. Um, but it's important you know that the oceanic is more dense, your continental is less dense. So um, in opposition to the oceanic lithosphere, we have the continental lithosphere. It is usually a very thick compared to the oceanic, 150 to 200 kilometers thick. Um, so in places, it's more than double the thickness of the, the oceanic lith lithosphere. Um, and it has the opposite com composition. Instead of being dark and mafic, it's going to be light colored and felsic. Um, with a lot of feldspars and silicas. Um, both of these respond to forces by bending or breaking. And when we get into structure, which I believe will be the uh, the earthquake section um, or the earthquake chapter, we will talk about bending of rocks and breaking of rocks. But the point is, if you take something larger, you can, you can bend it without it breaking. So like I can take this piece of wood, which isn't necessarily great... Uh, um, comparable to a giant rock package, but I can bend this piece of wood before it gets to the point where it breaks. If I take a small piece of this, I'm not going to be able to do the same bending. Like I can try, but it, it's going to break at a certain point and you're not going to get that, that big of a flex going on in the small part. Um, the same thing happens for rocks. Um, I can't take an individual rock and bend it. Um, I can, I can add, apply pressure to it, but it's going to break. But if I take a large package of rock that's several hundred feet thick um, and maybe several miles wide and I start to squish it together, 
Um, some of it might break, but others might just bend and fold. Um, and we can kind of see that in the rock record, and we'll talk about that in a different chapter. Um, so compared to the lithosphere, we also discovered using um, ground penetrating sonar and um, why can I not think of the word? Um, new geophysical studies, which were actually designed in France, um, we were able to look down underneath the surface and find the asthenosphere. And the asthenosphere is the key part to plate tectonics that um, Wegner didn't really know about. Um, he was just like the continents are just kind of drifting around. Uh, they go where they want to go. And that, that wasn't a good explanation. So the asthenosphere kind of brings all that about. Um, we know that we have hard, cool crusts on the outside. And we know that we have hot, molten mantle on the inside. That's all melted, and that's what fuels our, our volcanoes and our big igneous intrusions. Um, but right in between those, we're going to have something that's a little bit of both. We're going to have the asthenosphere. Um, so the asthenosphere is hotter and weaker um, than the lithosphere because it's really close to the mantle. Um, but it's not fully melted. It's in like a semi-molten state. And a lot of times we refer to it as like a plastic state. Um, it's going to move like really viscous honey um, instead of moving kind of like a rock. So they're nearly melted at this temperature and pressure. Um, it responds to forces by flowing. So when you have a continent that's pushing on it, it's, it's not really going to break. It's going to start to move around a little bit. Um, and it moves independently from the lithosphere that goes on top of it. And basically what it acts as, for lack of a better example, is the slip and slide um, that, that the continents slide around on. Um, you know, uh, a large person like myself would not be able to slide across the ground very well, um, but put a nice slip and slide underneath me, and here I go down the hill. Um, same thing with the continents. Um, how do we move gigantic continents around um, that way? I don't know what the, what a continent would weigh. It's probably a ridiculous number of pounds um, or kilograms, but um, how do we move that around? you got to have something pretty molten underneath it that's going to allow like a fluid flow um, and allow it to move from one part of the planet to the other. Um, so those are your two different terms, lithosphere and asthenosphere. Um, and then within the lithosphere, you have oceanic and continental crust, which, remember the density. Um, we'll talk about the density a lot, but your oceanic crust is heavier and more dense than your continental crust, even though it's, it's thinner. Now, here's a, a picture illustrating this. You have your thicker continental crust where the mountains are built up um, and the land is. You have your thinner oceanic crust, which is underneath the ocean. Um, down below that, before you get to the mantle, you have your hotter, weaker asthenosphere, um, and everything in the crust just kind of slides along um, on top of this, which is what allows the movement. It doesn't cause the movement, it's just what allows the movement to happen. So in all this discovery, um, as we discovered the mid-ocean ridges, as we discovered the asthenosphere and the movement of the plates, um, also, another thing that helped this out was putting satellites into orbit. Um, once we got satellites into orbit, we could do better GPS positioning and understand exactly how they were moving and at what rates. Um, much, much easier than just trying to figure it out from land. Um, so we figured out the lithosphere is broken into regular plates. There are seven major ones and a lot of minor ones. Um, also note, there are seven continents. Um, and they all match up to the continents except for two, really. Um, in continents, we separate Europe and Asia, um, which I've always like, what is, where's the dividing line between Europe and Asia? Um, because most people that live in Europe consider Eastern Russia as part of Europe, um, but Western Russia is not. So it's like the dividing line between Europe and Asia right in Russia. Um, and half of Russia's in Europe and half of Russia's in Asia. That always seems a little weird. Um, so in geology, we don't care about the people in their, their political dividing lines. Um, it's all one big continental plate. They're going to be together. Europe and Asia are together on the Eurasian plate. Um, so that leaves us one continental plate that doesn't match up to a continent um, as we know it in, in uh, geography. That's going to be the Pacific plate. Um, it's pretty much all oceanic plate. There's some islands on it, but it doesn't have a continent that really matches up. Um, so outside of that, you have the North American plate, the South American plate, 
the African plate, um, the Eurasian plate, Pacific plate, Australian Indian plate, which includes the Indian Ocean. Um, they might also be today including India as part of that, but I'm not 100% sure about that because India has a very different uh, history, and we'll actually talk about that at some point. Um, and then down here at the bottom, the Antarctic plate, which includes Antarctica. So those are your seven major plates, and we'll see some of the minor ones in a little bit. Um, before we can talk about how the plates move and, and what they're doing, we want to talk about their interactions. So we have three different boundaries that are possible between plates. Um, and obviously, maybe there's a little bit of overlap between some of these. But in general, you can put a definite line on these three different types of plate boundaries. Um, so divergent means what? Separating. Separating. If you're diverging, you're moving apart from each other. And so this is going to be the first one, divergent boundaries. And I brought my globe out for a nice illustration. Um, if I crack the world open, literally, I crack the world open and start to pull these two halves apart, um, what's underneath the surface? What's going to happen? Lava. Yeah, magma and lava are underneath the surface, and they're going to come to the surface, and they're going to fill that crack. Um, and so when I have lava come to the surface and, and start to cool at the surface, what have I just created new? Land. New land, new rock. Um, and so at a divergent boundary, we also call that constructive. Um, and this does get a little bit confusing because we have convergent. Convergent is not constructive. Convergent is destructive. Um, but just kind of think about what's happening. At a divergent boundary, I've literally like cracked the world open and now magma from the surface is flowing up to the surface, filling in that crack. I'm creating new land. Um, most of the time, it's not going to be above sea level. It's going to be oceanic crust. Um, but I'm creating new crust, and so I'm creating new land. Now, if I did that, we'd have a problem, which we don't currently have. Um, if I'm making new land over here and nothing else is happening, is the world getting bigger? Yeah. Like literally growing? Yeah. And that was one of the first... Um, I don't remember what theory it was, um, but we've had several theories that the earth was actually growing uh, in size. Um, they don't make a lot of sense, so I don't, I don't remember them too often. But, uh, would that be good or bad? Well, that would probably be bad. Um, I don't know. Maybe it'd be good. Because um, like population control. Like yeah, we're getting pretty crowded, so you have the earth would like double in size every couple decades. It'd be nice. Yeah. Uh, but then again, when you get into gravity, and things will just get heavier and heavier, and who knows what. Uh, that, that'd be an interesting like science fiction novel. Um, so in order to keep the world from getting bigger, and us to have weird problems like that, um, everywhere you have something being created, you also have to have something being destroyed. Um, and this actually works out really nicely this way. Um, so for every divergent boundary, there's also a convergent boundary. And where convergent boundaries happen, um, you have two different possibilities. Actually, you have maybe three. Um, you can have two continents slam together. And the thing about the two continents, they're basically the same density. Um, and it's going to be similar to like a, let's, let's make it a nice low speed car crash where nobody gets injured. But similar to a car crash, if you have like a head on collision here in the parking lot, um, you're going to hit and your, your hoods are going to like crumple up. Um, they're going to get all the little wrinkles and bends in them. Um, that's kind of what happens when you have two uh, continental crust pieces smash into each other. Um, the, neither one of them wins. They both just kind of smash in and, and create a mountain range. Um, and so we saw the mountain ranges on the previous uh, several slides ago uh, on the opposite end of the Atlantic Ocean. So somewhere in North America, somewhere in Europe and Africa. Um, when they came together the original first time, they smashed together and created those mountain ranges um, and then when they pulled apart, the mountain ranges stayed on each subsequent uh, continent. So um, that's one possibility. It's not what happens most of the time. What happens most of the time is you have an oceanic, uh, an oceanic lithosphere hit a continental lithosphere. And now is where the density comes into play. Um, it doesn't really matter how big something is. It's all about density as to whether it sinks or floats. Um, if I'm at the lake and I take a stick and I throw it in the water and it floats, um, it doesn't matter how much wood I get, I could cut down the whole tree and the tree could weigh like 3,000 pounds. If I throw the whole tree in the lake, it's going to float because it's all about density. 
Is it more dense or less dense than the water? It doesn't matter how much it weighs. Um, same thing with think about um, think about uh, like cruise ships. Cruise ships weigh millions and millions of pounds, um, but because we fill them with air, air is less dense with water. Um, they're not going to sink um, unless something really bad happens. Uh, so you could extend that even bigger and say if there's an entire continent that is less dense than the stuff around it, um, it doesn't matter what you do, the continent's not going to sink. It's going to stay up. Um, and so you smash it into something that's more dense, and the more dense thing is going to go down, the less dense thing is going to stay up. Um, and so your oceanic crust when in a battle with a continental crust or maybe even another oceanic crust, um, it's going to get pushed downward. And when it gets pushed downward, there's nowhere for it to go but down into the mantle, which is already melted. And so it's going to literally melt and get reabsorbed into the mantle. Um, and this is your destructive margin. So everywhere you have new land being created, there's some other place on the earth where land is being destroyed and recycled, um, which again plays into that thing that we found that there's not really any old oceanic crust. Um, 180 years is about the max. You can maybe find some older stuff that's been kind of lingering. Um, but most of the oceanic crust is 180 million years or younger. Um, and that makes sense because it's always being recycled. Um, always it's being pushed down where the continents have kind of been here since the beginning, not the very, very beginning, um, but uh, within the first billion years um, we probably got continents very similar to what we have today, and they've just been floating around, smashing into each other and separating out um, since the very beginning. And so all that time, the oceanic crust has been losing that battle and just constantly gets recycled. It gets created somewhere and then destroyed somewhere else um, and doesn't really have a lot of time to stay here up on the surface, uh, which is why it's only about 180 million years old. Um and then the last one, transform boundaries, which are generally not super exciting in plate tectonics, but um, we're familiar with at least one transform boundary, which is the San Andreas Fault in California, um, which is why when anybody tells you, no matter how much you want it to happen and how cool it looks in the movies, um, LA is not going to fall into the ocean. Um, we'll see it later on a different slide. LA is literally gonna slide up to where San Jose and LA are essentially in the same spot. Um, and you're going to have like the biggest traffic nightmare ever in the history of humanity. Um, it's going to be awful. But um, more than likely, unless something crazy happens, they're not going to go away or down. Um, they're just going to slide past each other uh, and, and just have a lot of earthquakes in the process. So that is a transform boundary. They call it conservative because nothing's created, nothing's destroyed. Um, they just literally slide past each other. No elevation changes. Uh, no separation or anything like that. So um, here's your global map, and I will point out a couple things. Um, these block images you will see quite often, especially on tests and homeworks. Um, you have your divergent boundary. Everything's pulling apart, and your molten mantle is coming up to fill the center. Um, and this isn't, like, exaggerated to help you kind of see it, but you can see that there is a, a ridge here. Um, that's your, your mid-ocean ridge, your, your mountain ridge that they saw as they were going from ocean to ocean. Um, and we'll see that in a second on uh, Google, Google Earth. Here, you have a convergent boundary with oceanic and continental crust. I did that backwards, oceanic and continental. Um, the oceanic is more dense. It's going to lose that density battle and get pushed underneath and sink where it will melt. Um, usually, if there's a continent nearby, some of that melt rises to the surface, like the, the lava lamp... Uh, um, intrusions that I talked about before, the plutons, um, and they will make it to the surface and, and become volcanoes, which is why when you have this kind of action, often you have the volcanoes right around the edge of this. Um, one of the reasons we call the Pacific Ocean the Ring of Fire, um, because all around the Pacific Ocean, you have subduction zones where this, melt is this plate is being melted, the melt is coming up and fueling your volcanoes, um, which is why you have a whole bunch of volcanoes here compared to the rest of the world. Um, and then transform boundaries. I'll show you this in a second. Um, San Andreas is like a transform boundary, but a lot of the transform boundaries actually happen in your mid-ocean ridges. So you can see this is North America. This is Europe, Africa, South America. 
right down the center of the Atlantic Ocean, you have um, the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and you can see these little green dots all along here. Um, these are a lot of different small transform boundaries, and they kind of relieve pressure, which, uh, you know what? I'll show you right now. So let me come here. Let me actually go to my computer so I can do that now. So, but this is satellite imagery of the mid-ocean ridge. So you have Africa here, uh, Europe up here, North America, South America. And if you go to just about the midway point in the ocean, um, you can see the mid-Atlantic ridge. And so if we zoom in, it comes, actually let me zoom it up just a little bit, it comes all the way up, kind of undulates and stays right in the middle. Um, it comes all the way up through Iceland. And in fact, there's a place in Iceland um, where you can scuba dive right in between the two tectonic plates. Um, there's this like huge chasm and you can scuba dive down in there. I think you can also visit where it's not underwater and you can just kind of stand in between it. Um, but you literally have the North American plate on one side of you and the Eurasian plate on the other side of you. Um, and so Iceland's kind of unique. It, it kind of straddles both plates. Um, also, Iceland has a lot of volcanoes, uh, and we'll talk about one of their weirdly named volcanoes later. Um, but it keeps coming up all the way up here until you get to uh, probably some boundary up here near the North Pole where we haven't really imaged very well. You can see the imaging kind of goes away up here. Um, also, it's probably a lot harder to image underneath the sea ice. So, um, And if we go south, it just continues to go south. There's Europe and the, the top of Africa over there with Morocco. Um, I've kind of gotten turned a little bit, but uh, keeps coming south all the way down into South America, in between South America and Africa. And you can see these kind of jut overs right here. These are your transform faults. And I've got this illustrated in just a second, I'll show you. But this comes all the way down until you get down to the, um, the Antarctic plate down here near, near Antarctica. Um, and so, hold up, it zoomed out really fast. Um, this is actually the world's longest mountain range. Not the highest, because it doesn't get that high, um, but definitely the world's longest mountain range. It stretches all the way from the Arctic plate all the way up to pretty much past the North Pole um, and it is continuous. Um, and so when they talk about the world's longest mountain range, it's, it's, none of it is above water. It's all below water um, as part of that mid-ocean ridge system. And then I kind of drew this to show you what the transform faults are kind of doing. Um, I know it's not as light as I would like it to be, but um, here you have a divergent boundary here. Down below you have a divergent boundary. But as the, the mid-ocean ridge kind of curves, you have these offsets in between. Um, and so these offsets are transform boundaries that just allow it to kind of move in different ways. They relieve, it, relieve stress. Um, so separation, both of these here are moving away. Both of these are here are moving away. But in the middle where you have this offset, you have two plates moving in different directions right next to each other. Um, and so you have this little transform boundary that is kind of formed right there uh, to relieve that pressure where on one side it's moving one direction on the other side it's moving the other direction um, that's where a lot of your transform boundaries come from and you can see even though both of these are moving this direction the old transform boundary is still there and probably somewhat slightly active uh, but they kind of spread out and that's what all these horizontal uh, features are right here is just old transform boundaries that have kind of been uh, relict into the plate. So nice. We don't need that anymore. So now what are the major differences between lithosphere and asthenosphere and how are each important to plate tectonics? The lithosphere is the brittle outside crust. The asthenosphere is like that uh, transition layer from the molten mantle to the brittle crust. And it, it's uh, like a plastic kind of flow that allows the lithosphere to move around on top of it. Um, know that the lithosphere is broken up into plates, and there's seven major ones and several minor ones. In fact, um, let's look at some of the minor plates. Up here, the Pacific Northwest, um, the little tiny Juan de Fuca plate is uh, on its last gasp. It will be subducted underneath North America pretty soon. 
Um, and it, it's what's feeding these volcanoes like Mount St. Helens and the other volcanoes uh, up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, you have the little Nazca plate. This will disappear at some time as well. Um, it's still growing a little bit on this side, but it's being subducted even faster um, on the, the coast of South America. Um, there's a couple small ones here and there. Uh, they have the Arabian plate, which is all by itself. It's a minor plate. Um, but in general, you have seven major plates that take up pretty much uh, most of the, the earth. So let's see what's next. Uh, this is just showing you the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and some diverging, a little, uh, some diverging a little bit. I don't know if I mentioned it on the appropriate slide. No, it's right here. It's the next slide. Um, so they talk about the Mid-Atlantic Ridges. And I'd just like to point out the Rift Valley um, in the center of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you have like the crack where everything is really happening. Um, and so that little crack in the middle is called the Rift Valley. So the Rift Valley is like a feature of the overall Mid-Ocean Ridge. Um, they they kind of don't fit together, valleys and ridges, um, but there's a valley at the top of the ridge. Um, another thing that I don't, I don't know if they go over super well in the, the PowerPoints, um, the reason this is a mountain is kind of because of expansion. Um, as you have this hot rock come up and fill these cracks, um, it's very expanded because it's hot. And then over time, as it cools down, obviously this is exaggerated. It's not, it's not that tall. And they even tell you here, it's only two to three kilometers high, which is not anywhere as high as like a, a high mountain range on, on the continents. Um, it's about a thousand to fourteen or four thousand kilometers wide, so much wider than it is tall. Um, and so it's not a super exaggerated feature like we show it here, um, but it does raise up a little bit because of the heat. As it moves out away from here, um, it cools down, it contracts, it gets compressed by the water and by the sediments on top of it. Um, and it, it does sink down a little bit. And so that kind of helps uh, add to the height of your mid-ocean ridge. Uh, let's see. They talk about seafloor spreading. Know that it doesn't spread um, very quickly. It depends on where you're at. Some places are faster than other. The average is about five centimeters per year, um, which isn't too bad. Um, that adds up over like several hundred thousand, hundred million years. Um, you actually get a lot of area that's created. Um, the fast ones are about 15 centimeters per year. The slow ones are about two centimeters per year. And this is actually something that you're going to do in the lab. Um, and so I hope everybody remembers their numbers in scientific notation, uh, cause we'll be dealing with a lot of centimeters, um, and a lot of distance over a lot of years. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's going to be part of the lab that we do. Um, know that your new lithosphere is hot and less dense but it cools and subsides with age, which is what helps kind of flatten that ridge out as it gets further away from the ridge. Uh, and I think we'll leave off here. Where are we at? 18. Let's see if we can get a couple more in. What time is it? Yeah, five, minutes. five minutes. We can get a couple more in, even though I didn't get this far with first period. Um, continental rifting is like what you have with your mid-ocean ridge, but it happens on the continent. Um, it doesn't happen quite as often because it's actually – very difficult to tear an entire continent apart, um, but it, it has happened before and does happen uh, even today. Um, so it occurs when you have a divergent boundary developed within a continent, um, tensional forces stretch and thin the lithosphere, um, your brittle crust breaks and eventually an ocean basin opens up and they should have a, a, a visual representation of that happening. So it starts like this, you get an upwelling of mantle, which pushes up and like bulges the continent um, gravity is going to take over, and the only way for gravity to pull this down is to pull it away from each other, downhill in either direction. Um, and so gravity will start to split these apart, um, which causes more cracks, which causes more material to come up. It just kind of exacerbates itself. And then eventually, um, if you get enough separation, the land gets low enough, you start to collect water in it. Um, if it's connected to the sea, it will have like an inland ocean. Um, and it just keeps separating. And so that's how you can get your continent split. That's how Pangea kind of pulled apart. Um, it's also, let me pull this up. Uh, the U.S. has had a couple of failed rifts. Um, 
So you can see places where this has happened in the Google. Failed continental rift. So there's a famous one in Africa. Uh, hold on, let's see. US. Images. So here's one in the, the kind of Midwest, I guess. Um, this is going to be a little bit to the left of the uh, Great Lakes. That's not the one I was thinking of. There's one over like in, uh, here we go. View image. So this one in uh, New Mexico this is the one I'm thinking of. Uh, so the Rio Grande Rift, basically you have this huge, huge valley area which is dotted with lots of little old volcanoes. Um, and so at, at a certain point in time in uh, North American history, um, the very west part of the continent attempted to pull apart from the rest of the continent. Um, and it, it eventually failed, because like I said, it's hard to rip continents apart. Um, but it, it did start and create a lot of damage and a lot of volcanoes. Um, this is well before humans were, were like populating or building on the area. But um, it did occur, and it, it's pretty interesting to study after the fact. Um, let's see, there's one in Africa that kind of succeeded, and then one that didn't succeed. So here is one of them. Example of continental rifting, they show this like, uh, this form here, uh, I guess this is around like Ethiopia. Um, so you can see that the rifting has kind of occurred. Um, there's a giant lake right where one of the rifts was. Um, and then right near that, there's actually rifting that did occur. Um, the Arabian Peninsula, you can see it, it, it fits together like a puzzle piece, um, used to be connected to Africa. It was, it was right down in here, and there was no ocean here. It was all just land. And so this ripped away, um, and as it happened, there's another rift that, that didn't really succeed that comes down in this area. You can almost see it on the map. Um, and so this is all different types of continental rifting that has happened before. Um, and it's pretty interesting stuff to study because um, with the oceanic rifting, it's all brand new um, because it gets it gets recycled away. Um, but with the continental rifting, you get to see stuff that's really old and, and uh, kind of takes you back into history. So we will leave off there for today. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, people at home, uh, the three of you, please let me know. Uh, hopefully this video works out and you make it to the end. And uh, I will see you everybody tomorrow.